Well, hey, everyone. So, yep, Angel Jose, just to confuse everyone in the Elixir community, right? It's not Jose. This one is Jose. So it's probably more of what you're used to. Uh, sorry about that. Very loud. Quick, uh, oh, wait, let me tone my voice a little bit. Let's move that this way, maybe. All right, let's do that. Okay, so quick disclaimer before we get going. Elixir and or startups have not been evaluated or approved by the FDA. They're not necessarily based on scientific evidence from any source, but they're fun. So that's kind of the little disclaimer. Uh, I have the very difficult task because I challenged myself to sell Elixir to a crowd of Elixir enthusiasts. So um, I hope you're on my side through this talk, which will be good. But uh, what I'm hoping with the talk is if someone's on the fence, maybe they're not sure if they can really try Elixir in their startup, or, or maybe if someone sees this talk or the notes of this talk after and they're kind of wondering, you know, we're a small team, can we really do this? Well, we are a small team, we've been a small team, and we were able to implement Elixir gradually throughout. So I'll share some of that and how we were able to do it. Uh, so hopefully this is one of those, if that guy can do it, so can you type of talk. So I'm looking forward to, to sharing a little bit of that. So I'll give you a little bit of quick background on myself. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to be in Austin uh, today. Uh, I come from a construction background. I've been programming a little bit under four years. And throughout my life, I grew up in construction. One of our largest clients, this is our family construction logo here, JBS Construction after my father's initials. One of our largest clients is actually, or well, was based out of Austin, Field Asset Services. So it's kind of fun to be back here and not be worried about construction and how many homes we're going to remodel this year and all that. So th that's very fun. I did that for several years. Um, eventually, the business dried up. We started switching. I started looking for different things to do. I opened up a car dealership for two years. Uh, so I was that guy selling you a used car. And that didn't work out very well. Uh, loved cars, hated the business. So eventually, I found myself, found my way into programming, which was a, a, definitely a life changer. But you know, for years, I, had, I hadn't been used to actually being like in a regular nine to five. So trying to find the right fit and actually the opportunity to kind of get started. That's how I got introduced to startups. I started going to startup events in the LA area and actually met up with a company that I started working with and I continue to work with uh, four years ago. So this is my journey into startups. First, we started off Sensei. So when I started with them, I started doing some basic HTML edits. I, I went to a coding boot camp. I learned Ruby. I learned Rails. And that's kind of what I started doing. But Sensei actually evolved into more than what I thought I was going to initially do. Sensei is a chatbot, and it has three main goals, to connect, to route, and engage. So we connect people via the messenger of their choice, uh, SMS, Kik, Telegram. Uh, we have messenger integrations. So we need to be able to send events and receive events and, and do that in, you know, in a way that scales. Eventually, the community grew to over uh, 3 million users. So we needed to do a lot of messaging handling and, and handling the session of that chat and doing a lot of that. Uh, but once we got messages, we needed to route. So we had the idea of being able to connect you to, uh, to people that know about what you want to talk about. So in our, in our database or in the data stores, we have tags. Every time a message comes in, we'll tag the conversation. We'll kind of try to classify it and do a little bit of that. So when a request comes in, we try to match you to the right person. So now we have routing involved. And then beyond that, now we have to ping the person again. So we have an anonymous conversation through our platform. So the other users never have to actually know who they're directly messaging. So that kind of translates that well. And then uh, engage. So you know, users are finicky, and they, they forget about you pr pretty quickly. So we try to do campaigns, kind of re-engagement campaigns along that. So uh, again, when it was 1,000 users, 10,000 users, it was kind of easy. You get, do a long running uh, Ruby process, do it in the background, throw some psychic, you got it done. As we started getting into more and more and more, uh, I tried doing the same thing, and it took me over two days to message the community, and messaging people at midnight is not really the preferred method of doing it. So that's kind of our history with that. Right when we're starting to get, oh, forgot to do that, just a little chatbot thing. But ju just as we started getting the handle of how to figure this out, we've been working on Sensei for about a little bit over three years now. Get the handle on that. And then, you know, we see this big opportunity. We're in Santa Monica. There's a lot of cryptocurrencies. Our, one of our founders is very involved in the blockchain community and sees an opportunity to take a lot of our learnings and apply it to the blockchain world. So right when we're getting a hang of things, we go ahead and join the party. So here's uh, us in the blockchain space. And yeah, that's fun. Uh, the blockchain, if you hear that there's a lot of buzzwords, it's because there is, right? It's new. So a lot of it is going to be buzz, but the good thing is now there's actually some actual projects, some actual code that you can start looking at. But we entered the space, so it literally was starting over again. There you go, there's us. So 
it, it's starting over again with a little bit of an of a extension of what Sensei was. We put the Sense token, it's an ERC20 token, but really the same concepts, attribution, taken, now open it not just for our bot or our applications, but open it up, consume data events. So same thing as receiving messages, right? Consume a, a ton of data events, tag them, so we can tag them to their wallet, some classification on the events, and then routing again. So if someone wants to chat with that person, access that person, we have a search layer on top of that or an access layer on top of that. So again, a lot of uh, uh, routing for that. And then the contact, well, that's one of the things we've been playing lately. How can you contact someone when you only know their Ethereum address? So there's no email, there's nothing like that. So we've been playing with a lot of those things on how we can actually do that. But it, it's a lot of the same kind of backend infrastructure that we were already using with Sensei. So it, it wasn't like a complete shift, but you know, just apply differently instead of just our sole bot applying it to other developers. So that was neat. It was fun. And this is just a little sample app that we put together, classifying events, saying it, attributing them on the blockchain, getting responses back, giving some kind of actual tokens to our users. So now to talk about startups. Typically in startups, now this is, even though it's a continuation of Sensei, it really was kind of like a reboot. We needed to start over, learn new things, new technology. So in startups, you typically have smaller teams, right? You probably have you know, a couple of engineers, if that, and then you have founders, typically non-technical. So you, you are gonna be doing a lot of cross-functional roles. Especially when you're small, you're gonna be doing some engineering, you're gonna be maintaining your servers yourself, you're gonna be trying to figure things out on your own. So that in itself is a challenge. The other thing about startups is that they move fast, so you have to be able to move quickly when opportunities come up. You can't really wait on long development cycles. You have to be able to move, take advantage of opportunities, when they come up, whoops, we lost that right there. There you go. And the other part is that they're insanely fun sometimes. So they're fun to be around a startup. It's definitely a learning environment. So that's why a lot of people are attracted to startups. There's the potential, obviously. And, and then for someone like myself coming from a non-traditional background, new to the field, I get to like cram in a lot of knowledge very quickly and, and get to play with different things very quickly. So that, that was something very appealing to me and it's also appealing to a lot of other people or else there would be no startups. So now to actually talk about what the upsells or the benefits of Elixir in a startup world. So let's talk about that now. All right, Wait, let's see. Hey, that didn't kick in. I promised my gifts would be better than this, but oh well. <laughs> the dog was supposed to be going yes, 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 yes. All right, so benefit one, uptime and scalability. Chatbots not responding definitely is not a feature. So if you think you hate it when someone ignores you in person, try a computer ignoring you, especially when it's supposed to respond to you instantly. So as we started scaling Ruby, uh, we started adding more platforms. So we started adding SMS, then we added Kick, then we added Telegram, then we added Messenger. So we started just layering more Ruby and more Ruby and more Ruby is just gonna fix it. So process managers, if, in case something goes down, uh, whether it was Foreman or something like God, and then we started just adding to that. Now, that didn't scale very well because now we had more dependencies. We spun up a different server. Now we have to make sure everything syncs up, put a messaging backbone behind that. So we typically use nats.io for that. And, and again, it's just more stuff to maintain. Uh, whenever we needed to communicate with our, with our entire user base, again, it was a challenge. Now we have to have long running processes. We schedule some cron jobs to try to do it in the background and, and just trigger it. But again, it, it was a little bit harder to do that. And, uh, Going back to, I mentioned it, but scaling across a couple machines and doing things in the background. So we have Sidekick, we have Redis taking care of that. Now, this isn't a knock on Ruby, it's more a knock on myself, like I completely blame myself for this, but it's still a challenge that we face, right? So how do we manage that now when we started taking a look at whether we can do things a little bit different? We started hearing about this language that all, you know how you have the Hello World apps? Rails was like the, the blog, right, the blog post. The Hello World app for this language was messaging and chat, which is Elixir. So we started looking at all these demo apps have to do with messaging, have to do with chat, so there might be something in there for us. So we started exploring uh, three engineers at this point, uh, none of us Elixir devs, but we started taking a look at whether we can actually start using it, and we just went ahead and you know, took the time to actually start building stuff in it. So here's what we discovered, uptime. Um, it's Erlang under the hood, so I mean, I'm, I'm the pitching to the, to the choir here, right? Erlang under the hood, but it's not so much for us the value of it being Erlang under the hood. It's the fact that you have the Elixir friendliness on top of Erlang. So Erlang engineers have figured out a lot of things and there's, you know, I have so much respect for that. 
for someone that's coming into something and trying to learn it, you know, without prior knowledge of that, Elixir is such a blessing to be able to take advantage of some of those strengths and put something friendly and accessible on top of it. So we, we love the fact that there's um, Elixir implementations, but taking adva advantage of the Erlang resiliency and making it beginner friendly. Uh, supervisors around our Ethereum clients. So Ethereum and anything really on the blockchain right now, you're going to hear a lot of testnet. That means it's still in beta mode. Uh, a lot of the tools are not exactly 100% accurate. Uh, you don't always get errors back when you should, and sometimes you get OKs when they're not OKs. Things just go down. The Ethereum network gets congested. There's a bunch of things that could go wrong, and all these things are outside of your app. So when we have a lot of our little services, we, we actually just wrap them as supervisors, and that way we can make sure that if something goes wrong, well, obviously, you know, we can spin, them, spin things back up, and we don't have to worry about that uh, downtime. Uh, again, Ethereum and the, st the space that we're in, a lot of the things are new. Sometimes we do need to do some things manually. There's this little function. Uh, I don't know how to say it correctly, but it's nonce or nonce. Um, so you have to keep track manually of your transactions on an Ethereum blockchain. Every time you send a transaction, you are responsible for keeping track of that. So if sometimes the nodes respond that everything was OK and it really wasn't, then you're going to get out of sync. So this is just a quick sample of that. We, we have some tools that kind of try to rebalance itself, but sometimes you just have to get in there and kind of resync it yourself. Well, that's one of the beautiful things in Elixir. It's not a big deal to attach to a console, to a running, to a running process. And just spin up IEX, we, we wrote some little mod, uh, functions, modules that help us kind of rebalance everything, and we can go ahead and do it. And, and it was great. So that's, it's easy, it's good to know that you can do these things without it being a big deal, to be honest with you. And whenever there's the smaller type of bug fixes, we can do some hot code reloading, right? Nothing, nothing major, but again, we can attach to a running process and do a quick recompile, maybe not the sanest way to do it, but for us, it, it's working. Again, we're, we're a small team learning how to use these tools. So the fact that we can use them without being experts on them really speaks volume to the quality and the resiliency of the tool. Um, so taking our Sensei bot, which is the one that has the most activity right now, it's been running the longest with, with the largest community or user base for us. As far as the directly related Elixir issues, we have yet to go down. And we've been running this now in production for about seven or eight months, I think, in Elixir. So not to say we haven't gone down. There's plenty of other reasons why we could go down. But at least when it comes to Elixir itself, we have yet to go down. And the good thing is that whenever things go wrong, yes, they go wrong, but you know, our supervisors just pick the process back up. Every time we have a message, it's just that one process that's handling that message. So things bounce back up fairly easily. Um, another thing is that if there are errors, we're able to really pinpoint them down. It's not just a mystery on where it happened. You know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it in a different slide, but the error logging that we get. As a startup, as a small team, those, those logs really are very valuable because time trying to waste debugging things when you can just pinpoint it, it means you're more productive and you can continue moving and moving forward. So for us, that was such a huge win. Scalability. So um, manage, so concurrency, right? Everyone talks about concurrency. But for us, it wasn't just the word concurrency. It was the fact that it was manageable. So we already have the tools in Elixir to be able to manage concurrency. So I'm learning a lot about Elixir, and, and I'm, you know, the beauty of spawning processes, and you could just you know, spin up processes. They take care of all the work. And Elixir really wants to work. So if you don't manage it, it's just going to continue spawning processes to its heart's delight, and then you run out of system resources. So that's not a good thing. So the fact that there's already tools in, available in the community to manage that, whether it's managing uh, processes for manage, uh, messaging an entire user base on the same machine that we're handling everything else, that was beautiful for us. Also, the fact that we can control the resources without really adding a lot of dependencies. Poolboy, assign some, some uh, how many processes you want to run, some backflow for that, and we're good to go. When we were bidding, building our, our messenger, our, our uh, campaign messenger, so again, in Ruby, I was used to having to do long things, long processes. The first time I ran it in Elixir, I, I was able to build a little gen stage implementation of this to, to rate limit it. Uh, it went way too fast. <laughs> it went way faster than what we should have been going. So again, having the tools readily available to rate limit was, was such a huge thing for us. And, and that's really something that you get for free. I mean, you put a little bit of effort into reading some documentation, reading some tutorials out there. 
and, and you really do get them for free. So that's something that for us, again, was a huge win. So now let's talk about release speed. Let's see if this one works. Nope, maybe. There, there you go, release speed. Okay, I like it when my gifts work. All right, so release speed. Uh, startups need to move fast. That's just the default, all right? So do you have the tools to move fast? So Mix, Mix is a complete package, right? For us, the fact that we can spin up a small app and not use anything else but Mix to have all the tooling necessary was gold. I mean, again, I learned on a Ruby and Rails, so for me, a lot of the commands that I see in Mix, I need a framework for them. But yet here you have a tool that can create a, an application. I don't have to worry about you know, downloading NPM first and doing this first and a package. That, it's just there. Create an app, and everything you need for, for your app to be functional is there. Compile it, testing, and manage your dependencies. So really, when you think about it, for a startup to not have to learn, or people working on a startup, to not have to learn how the whole ecosystem works just to spin up a running app, that, that's really valuable. And for us, that's why we love the fact that we can do that, because it's just Mix, and there is the entire framework on how you can immediately start writing code. And the faster I can get to writing code, the faster we can, we can move. So for us, that was a beautiful thing. Uh, again, production-ready apps with nothing else to master. Of course, there's a lot of things to master. But what I'm saying is that you can get something out the door that will run, that will be productive, that will have an impact, that could be your MVP or even beyond an MVP without having to go in. Now, once you start running into those issues, of course, like we're, we've been hearing in some of the talks and we're gonna learn more about through the conference, of course, there's a lot more to learn. But what I'm saying is for a startup, just being able to get out the door in such a simple tool set is extremely valuable. Phoenix, Phoenix, uh, super helpful to not have to debate, again, my background, right, with learning with Ruby. I'm spinning up a simple API. Should I use Sinatra or should I use Rails? Right? And that's always something happening in the back of your mind. You're doing that mental balance. Well, what if it grows and I'm gonna need to rebuild Rails anyways if I just start with Sinatra, so should I just start? So you're, you're kind of thinking about that. But with Phoenix, the beautiful thing is that it's slight enough that I don't really have to worry when we bring in new developers I'll talk about in the onboarding, but I don't really have to debate that. I'm comfortable throwing Phoenix because it's light enough that if all I need is APIs out of it, if all I need is sockets out of it, or, or the channels, we're good to go. So for us, that's been helpful. Uh, we started playing, like I mentioned, we're, we're working on the blockchain space now, space now particularly in the Ethereum space. And we're, we're coming up with a contact module, which is a way to be able to contact a user only via their wallet address. Now, we're playing with the different implementations, uh, whether we do it through ping, whether we do it through a, a, pull, a push style or a pull style. So we're playing with that. But for both of these scenarios, we just spun up some Phoenix. One of them is just listening for a channel. Uh, once a transaction gets signed on the front end, so we use MetaMask to sign transactions, it's just a little Chrome extension tool that gives you access to like the Ethereum API or Web3 in particular, or EVE.js. So we, we have this little thing in-house right now where we're testing it out. We can sign a message, sends a packet via a socket, opens up a channel. We decode the message in the back end to make sure it's, it's signed by the correct person. We respond back via the channel, and right away we can actually have a communication without ever knowing who that user was right through the socket itself. So again, it lets us play with things quickly. And in this community, a lot of the things you have to do, you have to make them available so people can start playing with them and they believe that you're actually building and you have an engineering team behind you. So we're not afraid to take these little demo things and just make it public because we know that it can handle it. It's resilient enough where it can handle it. If it goes wrong, it went wrong. It'll spin back up. So we're not too worried about that. So again, being able to scale or build prototypes, ship them, release them fast, huge, huge win for a startup like ourselves. Quick example aside from ourselves, um, I've gotten to work a little bit with a, a very early, early stage startup, Leg Day. They're building an SMS chatbot. Uh, they're really partnering with gyms to be able to engage their consumers. They're strictly SMS. Came to me for a little bit of help, advice, just which route they should go. Recommended and was able to convince them to go the Elixir route. Now, the cool thing about them is through the Elixir Slack channel, they were able to hook up with uh, Johnny Wynn from the, I think it's Elixir Fountain podcast. He was able to put something very quickly together for them. And within a couple weeks of this, they were already signing up clients, and they were already working with different gyms. I'm not afraid of them signing up clients, even though it's a very early release, because I know even if they sign up 100 clients, 2,000 clients, 
this can handle it, because I've seen it handle it on our end with a much larger messaging volume. So they have something now that they can just uh, focus on the UX, they can focus on the interactions without really having very, very heavy server costs. They don't have to worry about having to have extensive development on, on actual like, interactions or APIs. They could just worry on, on the UX side, on the flow, which is what a startup should probably be focusing on, making the experience pleasant for their consumers. So uh, yeah, I was, able to, uh, was able to convince them, and they're super happy. Another plus, uh, I wasn't expecting this. When I initially started giving some samples of how to do this, pipelines are a super clean way to explain code to non-technical people. Like, because they can see the steps, right? So you can explain the logic of what you're working on in a very simple manner without having them go deep into things. Because just visually, pipelines are very easy to follow. You do this, you do that, you do that, you do that. So that was a quick win. Uh, I was able to do a quick code presentation to the founders, and they totally followed what was going on. Or at least they pretended, but it was nice. It was nice anyway. And Johnny Wynn certifies this. Build fast, scale easily. All right, another upside. Let's see. Recruiting. It's playing now. All right, well, whatever. Recruiting. Let's talk about recruiting now. So, recruiting. The Elixir pool is growing. Uh, I think uh, Jim said that it's not, or someone said that it's nice to see the community grow. And, and it is growing. And this is only my second Elixir event, but it's nice to see a nice crowd, right? But the pool is still not super large where we can just hire to our heart's content. But there is opportunity to hire for fr from the friendlies. So who are the friendlies? Uh, Ruby. Ruby is, is an obvious friendly because of the history with the Ruby community. Uh, you know, you have Jose, you have uh, Chris. So there, there's definitely an interest, and there's a peak from the Ruby community. I can't remember uh, some of the last Ruby meetups that I went to that Elixir wasn't spoken about. So there's definitely an interest there. Uh, and the syntax makes it very approachable to OO programmers. We know it's a different mindset. We know that but at least it doesn't scare you away from trying it. And once you, you, you try a couple things out, then you start realizing you can't code in the same way, but at least you're hooked by that point, right? And, and you're willing to continue learning. So Ruby is, is, a, is a good target. Python, Python people is also a good target. Uh, a lot of the tool sets that we use, not everything is available in Elixir, so we do fall back on Python quite often. Also a very good target. Uh, the other opportunity is to hire from the fun functional language pools. So obviously, uh, Erlang, if you can hire Erlang engineers, well, you're, you'll be happy. I'll be happy if I can do that as well. Uh, Haskell, F Sharp, Lisp, Clojure. Uh, the person that, that I work with, the other engineer, very senior, been, been an engineer for many years. That's you know, his, his lifelong profession. It, he, he goes and he's like a Lisp programmer originally, and, and he does a lot of these things. And yet, we were both pairing up to discover Elixir at the same time. So it was actually a very neat experience to pair up someone with a traditional functional background and pairing them up with someone relatively newer, maybe who has not written functional program, and discovering the language at the same time. So we were discovering it together, and he was bringing in the experience from the functional approach. I was bringing and trying to convince him why it was good to have things be easy. And we were able to learn a lot together. Some things that he wanted to approach strictly in a functional approach where we were able to say, well, look, here's the syntax. It's there for a reason. Let's use it. Right? So, we were able to really get together and, and really have fun really learning the language. So if you, if you have that opportunity in, in your situation where you can pair up a very experienced program, even if they don't know Elixir, with a newer programmer, and, and just have them work together and discover the language together, it's a really, really big win that, that's really worked out well for us. When it comes to onboarding, once we're able to bring someone on the team, we have yet to recruit someone that is, strict, that is a strictly Elixir programmer by you know, their, their prior profession. So they've been maybe explored Elixir, dabbled in Elixir. We have someone who had never touched Elixir. But we try to start them off with just a brand new project. We, if we have it available, we'll carve out a microservice that we need, and we'll just let them have fun with it. Give them some resources, and just let them start from scratch, because that'll really expose them to the tool set. It'll expose them to the things, the, the way the app is organized. And it'll just really, really get their feet wet. And if it's a project that we can merge in as a microservice, then even better, uh, even if it's an internal tool. But just really try to start them off with a, with a, with a new project. We emphasize exploring OTP. That's the power, powerhouse behind uh, an Elixir project. Uh, Chris talked about how we try to do a lot of things in the, in the Ruby or Rails or, or object-oriented or framework mindset that doesn't really translate well. Or, or translates, which is nice, but you can do it better if you're starting to learn distributed, uh, distributed architecture. So uh, we, we encourage them to learn about OTP and explore. Uh, discourage overly defensive programming. That's one thing that I, I really uh, liked 
because I make mistakes. And the fact that people told me to just let it happen, that, that was pretty cool. So let it fail, but you know, you're gonna fix it, of course. But just the fact that it's, it's, you're not gonna be overly defensive when you're programming uh, in Elixir. And obviously provide access to learning resources. Uh, there's some great books out there. Uh, just recently I started reading a book uh, of learning functional programming with Elixir. I, I, sorry, I forget the author of the book. But it was cool, especially because I don't have that background, to see samples in Elixir itself. Right? A lot of the functional programming books out there are not in Elixir. So it, it was real nice to see some samples in Elixir itself and see how, how that relates to us. So those are the benefits that you probably have thought about already, right? We have, you know, uptime, scalability, resiliency, uh, recruiting and onboarding may be a little bit tricky, but there's surprise benefits also that we've kind of found out about. Surprise, oh, come on, there you go. Surprise benefits. <sighs> Elixir is so forgiving. It, it, it lets me recover from errors. I don't have to be overly nervous that my entire system is going to go down because I, I missed one thing. First of all, it'll first catch it at compile time, right? If something totally doesn't make sense, it'll catch it at compile time and tell me, yep, you messed up, go fix it. So it's very forgiving in that sense. The other thing, uh, Chris alluded to it, the, the difference between like when you mess up an Erlang and when you mess up an Elixir, like Erlang, it's just like argument error or something. And Elixir will say, you messed up right here. This is what the function one, th this is the actual thing that you try to pass to it, and it didn't work. And it just like hones you in on what you got to go look at and when you got to go fix. But you don't have to drop what you're doing just because an error happened, especially when you're starting, you're probably busy doing a lot of other things. So you can let that error happen, you have it logged, and then you know that that's just going to, again, it's supervised, so it'll spin back up. Every other message that comes in will still be handled. And now when you have the time for it, a little bit of standard time, now you can hone in and really dig into why that error happened. And because you have the arguments there, especially as you start learning how to code in a more functional approach with you know, not so many uh, dependencies and side effects, then you can really just test that one piece and see what went wrong when you had in that specific scenario. So for us, again, uh, it, it forced us to really learn about uh, functional, functional programming so we can keep pure functions and be able to test those bugs when they happen. Uh, another thing is um, the, sorry, this is a little bit small, but the applications and microservices kind of mentality. So in Elixir, you have the umbrella apps that kind of force you to think in isolation and not mix things together that probably shouldn't be mixed. So that was super helpful because then what that allowed us to do is take our Ruby app, carve out very specific things, translate them to Elixir, and then we use something to just glue it together. For us, it was nats.io or messaging queue or messaging backbone, right? So we were able to carve very specific experiences and start playing that in Elixir and then respond back via the same messaging and handle it in the rest of our application that was still Ruby. So it was very funny to me, at least, you know, from the user standpoint, there's no difference. But to me, it was funny to know that I would see like someone using our bot and I could pinpoint, oh, that's Ruby. And then something else would happen, oh, that's Elixir. And then I would see him get another message. Oh, that's Ruby again. And then do something else. And then, oh, that's Elixir. Because we were just literally bouncing back between Ruby and Elixir. And the fact that Elixir kind of has this mentality already, even when we were working in Ruby, started letting us write some of these things in Ruby to make it very easy to transition them into Elixir. And we didn't have to rewrite our entire app and launch and be afraid that we missed some logic. We could carve out very specific portions, even within the same flow, and just write them in Elixir. And the fact that, you know, kind of Elixir helps you think about it in that way was really helpful for us. Uh, now, in our current situation, it, it's helped us a lot because the blockchain tools and just the community in general, it's very early. There's still a lot of things that are being worked on. So even though we love writing Elixir, there's some wonderful Elixir projects out there that are really tackling building the tool sets for that. But we don't always have everything available. So sometimes we need to write a little tiny service in, in Python or write something tiny in Node and, and we use the same kind of scenario. We just message it, get a response, just that one thing that we want from that little service, get it back, and then we're back in the flow that we're used to. So for us, that's been really, really valuable. Another surprise benefit, totally non-technical, uh, functioning, functional programming principles beyond the tech. So uh, again, as I start learning things, something that helps me is sharing it with the team, especially with the, like just anyone on the team. I'll talk to anyone about it. I'll do the whole whiteboarding and, 
one thing that got, I got out of it is I, start, I started learning more about functional programming. Some things matched up well with the values that a startup, I think, should have. So one of the things that we talked about, uh, immutable values, so as a startup or as a team, we should always act according to our core principles. That shouldn't vary. So whether we're building Sensei or whether we're working on the blockchain, our core values shouldn't change. That should be like immutable, right? So that to me, it was, it was kind of just a fun thing to be able to talk about actual company values in a, in a functional thing. Uh, this one I like, pure functions limit side effects. So if I'm interacting with a coworker, I don't want to leave side effects behind. I don't want to interact with them and they feel horrible right after I leave. I don't want to add emotional baggage to them. I don't want to take them out completely with what, from what they were doing. So I was able to kind of just share, like, look, this is a pure function. Here's our side effects. You limit them, you handle them, and how does that translate to a startup team? Which was funny because then our co-founder, CEO, started using this slide. This is actually one of her slides. In her events, immutable value. So that was pretty cool. I kind of, like, infiltrated a little bit of functional thinking into her presentation. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Now, the biggest value that we've gotten out of, um, out of using Elixir is the community. So if you're thinking of using Elixir, but you're not sure, or your startup, you're thinking of switching to Elixir, you're not sure, this is probably the number one recommendation on why I would push you towards trying it out. There is a very, very supportive community behind it. Uh, the Elixir Slack channel, it's, it's amazing. I go on there all the time. Um, you know, always asking newbie questions, and there's always someone willing to help out. I mean, I, I have yet to not be helped when I ask something. And, and that really is such a huge value. W when someone's learning something and, and you're stuck, waiting for someone to just unblock you, like that one little answer could just unblock a week's worth of work. So it, it was such a huge value for us to have an actually active community behind the languages. And it's not just Slack or, or the specific Elixir Slack or Elixir forum. There's project-specific communities as well. So we've been using a lot of a tool for interacting with Ethereum nodes and Ethereum blockchain called Xtherium. That's uh, the team behind it. And they're writing a ton, a ton of tooling. And they have a Gitter channel. And they're extremely helpful, extremely helpful, again. Because right there, it's not just the patience to walk me through how the Elixir portion works, but also the nuances of working with Ethereum itself. So again, you have active uh, people that are wanting to be helpful. And that's something that I've noticed very specific to this community. Uh, another thing, the documentation. Documentation is friendly in Elixir. I, I don't know how many notice or don't notice, but being newer to, to engineering, when, when I started learning Ruby, the documentation was, was friendly. And it made it very easy for someone to get started, put it in their projects, implement things. When I've switched over to other languages, it, it just demands a little bit more, or there's a lot of domain knowledge that I might not know about. E even, even like Node projects, sometimes they just assume you already know about NPM and you know about these things. Well, if you're not really a Node developer, you might not be using a lot of these tools. I hardly ever work front-end work, so I don't use a lot of these things. So even to just use a tiny thing, I have to do a lot of like knowledge gap filling, right? With, with Elixir, I find a very similar thing to Ruby, where, where it's whatever you need, it's there in the documentation. It's friendly. It's accessible. And that's very valuable uh, when, when you're a startup and you're trying to move fast. So some proof of the value of the community. So here's a, um, this is the Gitter channel that I was talking to you about. These little symbols and code snippets are all like responses from the Ethereum nodes. And I don't know what to make of them. Go on the, on the Gitter channel for, for Ethereum. This person right here, Geoff Hayes. Super valuable. I have never met him aside from Elixir, and he's unblocked me so many times out of these things. So active community. We've tried giving him money. He's like, nope, nope, just want to help the community. So again, you have those type of people in this community right now. Uh, Elixir Slack channel. So here's one of the times that I needed help. I go on there, and I get help directly from Chris. And he tells me, not sure I follow exactly. I'm just kidding. That's a tiny snippet. He helped me a bunch. He helped me a bunch. We were trying to implement the socket in the channels, and, and we weren't using a full, full app, so we were just trying to get that JavaScript implementation and implementing it there. So again, you have that available for, for as a community. Um, so reviewing a little bit. So you have uptime and scalability. You have release speed. You have recruiting and onboarding and you have surprise benefits. 
right? So let me, I, I like that. I, I saw a presentation like this one. Let's do this. Uptime, scalability, release speed, recruiting and onboarding, surprise benefits. What do we get? Well, we get Elixir, right? So that's why I really am excited about being able to encourage other startups to use uh, Elixir because we've seen so much benefit out of it. And, and yes, we were nervous at first, but once we started implementing, we saw that there really wasn't a lot to be afraid of. Uh, I wasn't expecting this to make it into this presentation, but Chris said something very valuable that really resonated. A lot of people that are coming from different languages, they're used to writing in a certain way, right? So the, it was the whole stateful versus stateless conversation. And even though we admit we started writing Elixir in a very stateful, just pretty much transferring what we knew in Ruby into a framework that let us do it a little bit different, a little bit faster, a little bit more resilient, it still worked. It's not like we had to become experts at Elixir and learn all about stateless and distributed to really start taking advantage of the language itself. So even without knowing all that, we still saw tremendous benefits. Now, as you start progressing, as you start learning, you start realizing there's such other uh, huge benefits and wins if you actually do take the time to learn about these things. But we didn't have to do it before we started writing. We could do it as we started learning about that. So that to us was super, super valuable. Lately, I've been working with a different type of startups. Like I said, we're in the blockchain company, so I get to meet a lot of other blockchain companies. A lot of times you'll see or hear about ICOs. Let me see if I can do this here. Um, I'm not sure if this will play correctly if I do it from here. But this was a tiny video. I don't, I don't know if I can play it. Oh, it's playing. It's going to take, I wanted to fast forward, but I'll, I'll let it play. Uh, so what this is telling you is just kind of the history of the ICOs, uh, which is pretty much the equivalent of startups in the blockchain space. Uh, January 14, you don't see many, right? You're going to see like Ethereum pop up right there. This is January 15. Again, they're not, it's not that huge. It's not, it's not a lot of traction. Uh, I wanted to fast forward because really, even though we're starting at only 2014, the action really starts happening somewhere around 2016 for it to be making some noise. So as we progress here, we're going to start seeing some of the other ICOs that make an impact. We start getting to 2016, again, a little bit slower. You're starting to see the growth, more ICOs popping up, a couple more. Now a huge one, this was Dow, and it pops up. But look at what happens once we start getting towards 2017, and not even at the beginning of 2017. We're going to get to maybe first quarter, second quarter 2017, and something crazy happens. That's all within the last six months, eight months, right? That's a crazy amount of new startups <laughs> that, trust me, I, I, I'm in that space. They need some of the experience in this community. They, they really do. The tool sets are not there. They need some of the resiliency. They need some of the stability, some of the scalability that, that you know, we have advantage of with, with Elixir. So there's some projects already doing it, but most of these are not, and they, they probably are not even thinking of those terms. But if you start seeing some of these code base, you can identify where we can be valuable as a community in helping some of these projects actually succeed. So, but there are some, like I mentioned, uh, the Ethereum guys, they're working on, on building a whole suite of utilities to interact with the, with the blockchain. And, and it's really a bunch of tools. It's not just one repo. There's a ton of repos because there's different pieces. And, and they could use some help also, writing like a friendlier layer on top of all the different utilities they have. So th they're working at it, and I know they're heading towards a bigger project. Uh, this is another company that I've spoken to, paybear.io. They're putting kind of like, making it easy to uh, accept cryptocurrencies as merchants. So just through their app, they'll have a friendly API they can hit. It's actually an API out in beta right now. And when I talk to them, why'd you choose Elixir? Why did you choose Elixir when you're you know, doing these type of things? The tooling is not 100% there yet, like I mentioned. So they are having to work a little bit harder to be able to use Elixir, just as we are. Well. Same reasons we keep hearing, reliability, simplicity, performance, scalability. So these are actual projects that are using Elixir right now. We have not only projects in the blockchain, but we, we have actual blockchains that are written in Erlang. So you have the Eternity project. They're writing a blockchain, correct, uh, in Erlang. They have a testnet out right now, which is really cool. And you know, we've been following that project. We've been uh, seeing what they're doing. Uh, we would love to, to be able to start exploring what we can do supported by tools or development team that's writing in a similar fashion to us. And they even have an Elixir research branch oh, that they're working on. So again, very cool projects, the new phase of startups, at least in this blockchain space that, 
that could really, really benefit from a little bit of the experience that you all have in the Elixir and Erlang community. So, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's so good that there's such a cool community that made it not just Elixir is for startups, but that really made it accessible to us as a startup to be able to benefit from all the experience that we have here in the community. So thank you for letting us join that ride. So since there's, we are hiring, jobs.makesense.com, but just feel free to contact me directly and you know, we'll chat it up. Thank you. Uh, we do have like one or two minutes for questions if you want. If we're gonna do questions, I have to go back to this disclaimer. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there's lunch involved. So yeah, we can do one or two if you want, but we're good. Um, so I've kind of noticed uh, there's a there's a, an elixir based blockchain popping up. I don't know if you've heard of Ultra Dark, um, but it looks like it's it's kind of been uh, they started working on it. Uh, looks like a couple weeks ago. Oh, nice. Um, have you have you noticed that at all? And had N not about it? that one in particular. Not that one in particular. But yeah, there's a lot of projects. I think as people start facing some of the challenges, there that you know just a distributed. Well, the blockchain in, in general, right? That's the whole concept, being distributed, decentralized. As they start facing some of these issues, they're going to start looking at why whatever they chose to write it in might be limiting in that. So that's why I think there's more interest now in, in taking a look at Erlang or Elixir for those things. So, but yeah, I haven't particularly heard about it, but I'll check it out. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.